Chieftain here. Every year I tend to do an article highlighting veterans who work for Wargaming on Veterans Day. We realize it's Remembrance Day in a lot of the rest of the world, but well, we're in the US. This year though, we're going to do it a little different. Instead of an article, we thought we'll put it on video and let them introduce themselves. I'm Ray Haslip. I served in the United States Army Reserve for six years as a combat medic. I think when I was in, it was called a 68 Whiskey. I served in uh, Iraq for one year with a combination of Kuwait. Our, my combat mission was uh, be the medic for a platoon of crazy combat engineers. Hello, I'm Kyle Purcell. I fixed Apaches in the Army for six years. My name is Marvin Chow. I served with the United States Marine Corps between 1991 to 1997. I was a legal assistant with the 3rd Marine Air Wing, Semper Fi and URA, and happy Veterans Day. Hello, I'm William Claney, and I served for six years in, as military intelligence in the Army. Hello there, my name is Marcus. I served in German military uh, for 12 years uh, as an infantry sergeant. I wish you guys a uh, happy Veterans Day, uh, good luck, and have fun with family and friends out there. Be safe. And myself, Nicholas Morn. You all know me. I'm a tanker, cavalryman, U.S. Army. I have the rank of Major, 16 years so far, two tours, one Iraq, one Afghanistan. Oh, and by the way, I started off in the Irish Military Reserves back in 97. Ended up as a three-star trooper, which sounds impressive, but actually ends up being a private first class. Now we're going to segue on a bit. If you recall back a ways, we did a video called War Has No Nation, and we brought in a couple of old veterans. Well, a chap by the name of Tom Sater was the American entrant. He was in the 7th Armored, served under General Patton, and his service record basically started in France and ended up in Czechoslovakia. Over the course of the filming, he had me in stitches for quite a while, and we didn't use a large portion of it in the video. So I thought today would be as good a day as any to bring it forth, and you can have a listen to his stories yourself. Okay, so firstly, who are you? Where do you came from? Well, my name is Tom Sator. I, I was born in Budapest, Hungary, and I came to the United States on the 12th of, to San Francisco on the 12th of May, 1939. So, under what circumstances did you join the Army? Were you drafted? Did you volunteer? No, no, I, but I had to register at the draft board. But I wasn't a citizen. And uh, in 1941, uh, when the Japanese invaded uh, Pearl Harbor, the Germans and the Hungarians declared war on the United States. So I immediately became not only an illegal resident, but also an enemy illegal resident. And I tried to join the army because the immigration department wanted to deport me. But there was a very kindly immigration agent and he kept postponing my file. Finally he said, I don't know how long I can keep this up. Why don't you join the army? I said, I, I tried, but they said, they, they have no jurisdiction over me because I'm an, an, an illegal enemy resident. But he finally knew somebody at the Presidio, and I went up and there was a captain. He said, will you, will you be willing to renounce your Hungarian citizenship? So I asked him, where do I sign? He said, okay, come back tomorrow. Okay, so you joined the Army, you went to basic training and tank school. Where? Fort Knox, Kentucky. Um, what was tank school like? Well, t I tell you the truth, tank school was, was a little different because mostly they taught me geometry and how to maintain an engine. And they showed us uh, where the tracks were on a tank, and where the turret was, where the gun was, but beyond that, very little. So what duties did you have in the tank? What positions were you? Oh, well, I was basically a loader. I was a loader, basically, that was my, and, but I did some bow gunning and some driving. What was your route across France to, to Czechoslovakia? How, how did, where did you go in your war? Well, you know, I, I was in England in a rear echelon unit, and after the Battle of Aracourt, they needed a replacement, so I basically was a replacement. So they sent me to Chateau Salen and and through uh, Paris, the replacement depot, and they assigned me the 4th Armored Division. I had nothing to do with it, you know. I was a private soldier. 
I wound up in the Company B, 37th Tank Battalion. And from then on, we went to Alsace, to Singling, from Singling up to Bastogne, to Belgium, to Luxembourg, and then into Germany, across the Rhine, and across Germany all the way to Chemnitz, from Chemnitz to Bayreuth, to Czechoslovakia, and that's where the war ended. What was your first impression of the Sherman tank? Well, when you f first see a, a big tank like that, you're really, I mean, you're, it's formidable. And, okay. and, and it's big, and you try to get in, and they teach you how to get on it. And you learn very quickly, because when, you, when, when the chips are down, you got to get in and get out very quickly. Did you, did you feel powerful and invulnerable in, in the tank? Or? Yeah, I, as a matter of fact, there's no feeling like it. You sit in the turret, and it starts rolling to a village, and you're sitting up there, and you're looking at down to everybody, and, and you feel like you're, man, you're, you're a conquer, conqueror. Uh, but the trouble comes in when somebody starts shooting at you, and then the whole thing changes very quickly. In hindsight, did, uh, did your opinion of the Sherman tank change? Did you think it was, do you still think it was a great tank, or? I still think it was a great, of course it was a great tank. Listen, what was wrong with it? It was a, the, the 75 gun was too small, there's no doubt about it. The gun sight was inadequate. Sherman was a very reliable. We, we had one tank in the outfit that they said came all the way from Normandy to Czechoslovakia. Can you beat such a thing? So to me, look, we didn't know any better, let me put it to it this way. But the fact was that you were inside and you were protected from artillery and small arms fire. And that was a big thing. It was a very big thing. Uh, to me, the Sherman was a good tank. It was fast, it moved fast, it was reliable, and uh, hey, it protected us. Your, your tank, what was your relationship with your tank? Did, did, was it like your home, or was it just a piece of equipment? I was very fond of my tank, because it protected me from small arms fire, from artillery, and I was much happier inside than out. I'll be honest with you. How did you make your coffee? Oh, well, at first, uh, you know, the, each tank was equipped with a coma stove, it, which was, you know, high, and when you, when you lit it, 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 it took off in a big flame, which, which was, you know, so I don't know, I think it was in the Elsa someplace, I think in Mittersheim, we ran across a, a tank, and the tank had a German field stove. And this was a wonderful, it was flat, and it was easy to light, and burned with a blue flame. It was a beautiful piece of equipment, so I stole it. And we had that, I had that. Everybody wanted it, of course, but I, I had it and I sat on it. Did you? Uh... Did you have any traditions or superstitions in the tank? Superstition, well, there was an old GI superstition, never light, never light three people on a match, you know. Uh, that was, you never, never cross, shake hands crosswise. That's the, the standard. You, you never light, light three, three guys on a match. Hmm. I haven't heard that one. Huh? I didn't hear that one. No, that was, the, you, you know, because we all smoked, everybody smoked, but you never, you never light three guys on a match. Two is maximum. Now, t today it's like we can't have apricots. You're not allowed to have an apricot on a tank today. Apricot? Apricot. No apricots on tanks. Why? Because they're bad luck. You're kidding. No, no, this started with the Marines in ah. 1944. And I, I guess somebody figured out that all the, all the Sherman tanks that were destroyed had apricots. And they probably had other things as well, but they focused on the apricots. Oh. And ever since then, apricots have been bad luck. I guarantee you, I never saw an apricot in my tank. <laughs> no, no. The only thing I saw is K rations. Can, can you give me a best memory and a worst memory of being in the tank? The worst memory? The best memory and the worst memory. Well, the best memory is ride, riding through Germany and, and going through towns 
with the white, white uh, sheets hanging out the window and sitting on top of the tank and, and you know, you feel like a, a vic yeah, you feel like a vi very powerful. You know, you know, hey, you're a conqueror. I live through this and I'm here and I'm sitting on top of a tank and boy, the rest of the world is nothing. You, you really, you're really something, believe me. That was an unbelievable experience. If you never had that experience, you haven't lived. I want to tell you something. The worst experience was, of course, when we got hit with a bazooka. And that was, I, I thought I was dead, you know. Did, uh, did an enemy tank ever shoot at you? Or was it, did an enemy tank ever shoot at you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bigonville. Bigonville was the, we, we knocked out. It was a, actually, it was a Sherman the, the, with German markings. It belonged to the 9th Armored Division. And the Germans kept, must have captured it, and they used it against us. They put a German marking on it, and that thing came over the hill and knocked down a tree. We all saw it at once. And, and Joe, Joe put in five shots in the turret. <laughs> and I, I loaded five shots in there. Sergeant Grady's tank was to my left, and after this section was over, he, he came over. He said, I thought you guys were shooting the 50. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. I, I've never, I never moved so fast in my life. But, but Joe, Joe put five shots into that turret. You could put a newspaper over it. Um, okay, so you, you said you worked for Abrams. What was Abrams like to work for? Well, you know, I was very lucky because I first met him in Mittershine. Abrams had a habit of coming down to see every company personally, especially before an action. He'd come down and talk to the guys and tell us what we're going to do and why. The first time in Mittershine, we trooped around him and, and he says, well, he says, we, have a, we have a new arrival. And tomorrow we're going on a small road march. And we're going to so show the gentlemen how we earn our living. And this small road march turned out to be singling. And singling was a, a real brutal battle. But anyway, uh, he was, I liked him because he's very good to me. He did things for me. He, he helped me get back to Budapest. And, and uh, I found, I, I admired him. He was very brave, bravest man I ever met. He always sat on top of his tank, the turret, with his legs dangling down and a mic in his hand, directing everybody where to go, what to do. And he always, I never, I, as far as I know, he never got wounded. But my God, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have done what he did in, for $10 million. <laughs> I thought, I still think I was extremely lucky that I, I, have, I, I met a man like that. He, he was a great, he truly was a great man. How, you know, how, how did you discover the war was over? How did you find out? Well, we, it was, I think, the afternoon of the 7th of May. And we're sitting in a tank in, 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 Czech, in a small town called Horazdovice. And all of a sudden, our stations to one, our stations to one, announcement, or something like that. And believe it or not, Churchill's voice came over the uh, radio, announcing that, that uh, the Germans signed the surrender agreement, that the ceasefire and the war is over in Europe. So what was your first thought? Thank God, I'm alive. <laughs> of course, Let, let's have a drink. Let's have a drink. Um, and so it was, you know, everybody got out of that tank, the, the infantry jumped up, and everybody started firing in, in the air. It's one of the things that, I, I, I presume the same, I'm so happy from the experiences that the Army gave me, but yeah. I never want to do them again. I, I, listen, I wouldn't do it over if you paid me 10 million, but I wouldn't give it up, I, I, I would 
no matter, I, I would change it for nothing. We'll be hearing more from Tom again at a future point. So from those of us here at Wargaming America, to the veterans, we salute you. And to those of you who commemorate Remembrance Day, we remember them also.